This is a film about the Oriana, the first Oriana. She's seen here in P&O colours, coming back from a refit in Germany. In 1954, I was sailing as a cadet in Orion when Ford Geddes, one of the Orient Line directors who was also travelling, announced to the passengers that it was the intention of the Orient Line to build four 40,000-ton superliners to replace the ships in the fleet at that time. They were Tranto, Orontes, Orion, Orcades, Oronze and Orsova. Plans were already underway to build the first of these, which was to be Oriana although we didn't know that at the time. By the late 1950s, air travel was becoming much more common and the steamship companies were finding it ever more difficult to fill the empty berths in their ships. In 1954, the Orient Line started a service from Sydney to the west coast of North America. P&O, which was running a service to Sydney and to the Far East, soon joined the Orient Line in this venture under the title the Pacific and Orient Lines. It soon became clear that the days of the mail ship liner were numbered and the Orient Line just built the one 40,000 tonner, the Oriana. The same could be said for P&O, who built just the one, the Canberra. So, the SS Oriana was the last of the Orient Steam Navigation Company's ocean liners. She was built by Vickers Armstrong and Barrow and Furnace, Cumbria, and launched on the 3rd of November 1959 by Princess Alexander. Originally resplendent with her owner's traditional corn-coloured hull, Oriana appeared as an Orient line ship until 1966, when that company was finally absorbed into the P&O group. Faced with unprofitable around-the-world passenger routes, the P&O's white-hulled Oriana was operated as a full-time cruise ship from 1973. Between 1981 and her retirement from service five years later, Oriana was based in Sydney, Australia, operating to the Pacific Ocean and Southeast Asian ports. Deemed surplus to P&O's requirement, in 1986 the vessel was sold to become a floating hotel and tourist attraction first in Japan and later in Shanghai in China. And then she went to Dalian in northern China. And as a result of damage sustained in a typhoon where she was severely damaged, she was eventually sold to local breakers in 2005. The pictures here are of her in dry dock in Cornwall before her maiden voyage and here we see her in Southampton ready to start on that first voyage to Sydney. Before she can set sail she must satisfy the Board of Trade and here we see them lowering her lifeboats as a test. She set sail bound for Sydney and beyond on the 3rd of December 1960. Good luck to Oriana. Crowds come down to wave her off. As originally built, the Oriana would take 638 first class passengers, 1,496 tourist class passengers, and she had a crew of 903. 
We can watch her now as she draws away from the wharf. Passengers on board are waving goodbye to their friends. Some of them are looking forward to starting a new life in Australia. She glides gracefully down Southampton Water towards the Solent. A shot of the bow wave taken from the forecastle. Gibraltar is the first port of call. She then called at Naples before arriving in Port Said, from where she would transit the Suez Canal. We see here the bumboats selling their wares to the passengers above. Again, a shot from the forecastle as Oriana passes through the Suez Canal, makes her way into the Red Sea, where she's accompanied by a shoal of dolphins. We can watch her now as she steams down the Red Sea. All of the film on this DVD has been converted from old cine, taken by passengers and crew members as they travelled on the ship on mail voyages and cruises. The quality varies accordingly. We now see Oriana in Aden, Aden was the port where the ships would take on bunkers. It was always very popular with crew members who could go ashore in the duty-free port and buy such things as electric razors, transistor radios and even television sets. But there wasn't a lot for the passengers to see, other than the dusty streets of Steamer Point or the arid rocks of the crater. A launch comes alongside to discharge passengers and crew, 
returning to the ship, no doubt very hot and very thirsty. The next port of call was Colombo, in what was then Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. I see Oriana approaching the harbour, where she'll drop anchor. These pictures were taken from the deck of Orion. Then came the long passage between Colombo and Fremantle in Western Australia, where a brand new passenger terminal was put into use for the first time. We next see Oriana in the Great Australian Bight, pictures taken from the old Orontes. Oriana would then have called at Melbourne before arriving in Sydney. We see her here arriving on that maiden voyage. She passes a manly ferry and you can see the harbour bridge in the distance. Here she's passing Cremorne Point. Oriana approaches the new key in Circular Key. I was serving in Orcades at the time and I had the opportunity to visit Oriana on New Year's Eve. I was sitting quietly with the accounting officer and the office of the watch when we were suddenly disturbed by ringing of bells, fire engines arriving en masse. Nobody had told the ship that they were carrying out a practice on the new terminal and I have to say it caused the office of the watch some consternation as he first thought the ship might be on fire. Here we see Oriana berthed at the new terminal in Circular Quay, picture taken from the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Oriana was about to depart for her first trip from Sydney to the north coast of West America. Literally thousands came down that day to see this brand new ship off.
the next port of call would have been Auckland and then Suva, Fiji, where we see the police band on the wharf. After leaving Fiji, the ship would call in at Honolulu for her next port, Vancouver. Once again, a flotilla of little boats came out to meet her. Next came San Francisco, where once again an armada of small boats came out to greet her, as did the helicopters flying overhead. You can see in the distance the Golden Gate Bridge Here we're looking at the foreshore of San Francisco. The next port was Long Beach, Los Angeles. Here we see Oriana in rough seas, pictures taken from the boat deck. Calm at last, crew members relax on the forecastle. We now move on to film taken after 1966 and we see Oriana here in the King George V dry dock in Southampton. We can see the bow thrusters, which were the first to be fitted into a large passenger liner. The boot topping is green, it had been traditional for piano ships which were white to have a red boot topping, but after the 1966 takeover, as a sop, all wear liners were painted with a green boot topping. This didn't last long.
some more pictures of Oriana as she leaves a German shipyard after a refit. Here is Oriana again, this time in Southampton after her refit. One of the ship's agents on board took these pictures. It's quite strange to see a car on deck like this. I imagine it was used by one of the crew, possibly an officer, during the refit. We now see all the preparations being made to get the ship ready again for sea. Before the bulk of the passengers embark, we have a chance to look around the ship. It will still be quite a while before the main body of passengers are allowed to embark. Flowers are being prepared for the various public rooms. There's still a lot of work to do before the ship can sail. Deck chairs taken off for the refit are being returned to the ship.
A lifeboat is tested. In this picture, we see Oriana berthed behind the S.A. Arangi. The ship is now ready and passengers are beginning to embark. Luggage for the cruise is being hoisted aboard. Passengers now line the decks as she prepares to sail. A mixed naval and royal marine band play on the dockside. And this little fella bangs his drum.
Passengers' friends and well-wishers wave the ship off and streamers are strung between the ship and the dock. The gangways are lowered. And the ship moves slowly out into Southampton water. Despite cloudy and overcast skies, passengers have found the deck chairs as they await the lifeboat drill. Apart from the passenger drills, regular drills are held by the crew each week, sometimes lowering boats to the embarkation position. Oriana arrives in Helsinki. Passengers go ashore by launch. The next port is Stockholm. Once again, the passengers will have to go ashore by a ship's boat. And so on to Copenhagen. Here oil is taken on and the passengers disembark to start their sightseeing. We join Oriana again on a Mediterranean cruise. Ship 
left Southampton is now going through the Bay of Biscay, which is living up to its reputation. With the weather a little calmer, passengers are invited to visit the bridge. With the storms all behind us, it's time to relax in the Mediterranean sun. Palma, Mallorca. The next port will be necessary to go ashore in the launches. Porto Azuro. Again, Oriana anchors out and the launches are used to ferry passengers to and fro the shore. Another port, another day. Some more inside shots. And here we see Oriana approaching Madeira. At this time, most of the liners and cruise ships anchored outside the harbour walls.
another cruise has entered and Oriana is back in Southampton. See you once again. We're going to move now to the other side of the world as Oriana undertakes a Pacific cruise. Here we see some of the officers playing the passengers at cricket. Oriana is birthed at Circular Quay in Sydney. Seen from Arcadia, Oriana is birthed in Suva, Fiji. Another port, pictures taken in rather cloudy weather. Although this is a beautiful part of the world and generally sunny, there are also some very severe tropical storms. These islands get a lot of rainfall. And the seas are not always as tranquil as one might imagine. Let's have another look in calmer waters as Oriana comes back from another refit. Here, Oriana is in Mexico. We pick up Oriana again as she prepares to transit the Panama Canal. At the time of making this film has talk of the Panama Canal being widened to take the larger cruise ships. Oriana and Canberra were two of the biggest ships that could pass through at this time. Let's just watch for a moment as the ship goes through the canal. 
through the various locks as they open and close to let her through. And as the mules steady her as she passes through the locks, You will see in this picture just how tight a fit it is. Here's a sight worth seeing. The Italian liner Michelangelo, the French liner France, and bringing up the rear, the Oriana. Having travelled around the world, we see here Oriana about to sail again from Southampton. It's yet another Mediterranean cruise. It's not too long before they reach their first port. A 
a little relaxation before going ashore. I have to confess, I do not know which port this is, but quite clearly a number of the passengers are going to use the services of the local garries. Back on board, passengers are playing coit tennis. Whilst others, less energetic, just soak up the sun. Oriana is about to call in Malta. When these pictures were taken in the late 60s or early 70s, it was still common practice for ships of this size to anchor in the harbour. Passengers are ferried ashore in the ship's boats. Coming back on board from a very hot day ashore, passengers will be pleased to get into the air-conditioned ship and some, no doubt, will head for the bars. The next port was Malaga. From here, many of the passengers will have taken the opportunity of a trip to Granada.
back at sea and the passengers have a chance to visit the bridge. The next port of call, Lisbon. Oriana makes her way home. We leave Oriana in Southampton. In 1986, the ship sailed from Sydney for the last time and sailed to Osaka in Japan where she was to become a floating hotel. But this business was unsuccessful, and she was sold to the Chinese and moved to Shanghai in 2002, before moving to Dalian, where she was so badly damaged in a typhoon that she had to be scrapped. We see her now as she sails off into the sunset. <laughs> 